This is I'll Let Me Sum Up. You're um, actually just checking. <laughs> you guys are recording, right? I've been recording for a long time. I always record early so we get these little nuggets. Of gold. Of gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I've been around a small char today and dealing with other nuggets, which will remain nameless. Oh, well, I've been around a small cat dealing with uh, nuggets too. So <laughs> happy days for us all. <laughs> We're starting well, Luke. Yeah, this is this is champagne content. <laughs> so. Aren't you glad we recorded early? This is a let me sum up your regular deep dive into recent reports on climate and energy. I'm Luke Menzel, recording today on Wurundjeri land. And as always, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Global Vice President for Marketing and Extortion at the Let Me Sum Up podcast, Frankie Muscovich. Hello, Frankie. Good evening, gentlemen. Coming to you from Gadigal land and keen to crack the metaphorical whip tonight on all sorts of fronts. And a man at the vanguard of virtual reality fitness, Tenant Reed. Good day, Tenant. My my boss saw that video you recorded, Luke. Of, uh, <laughs> me making a complete ass of myself <laughs> at the uh, smoking remnants of Australia's pavilion at COP27, playing Beat Saber. Uh, he had no mm. words. <laughs> <laughs> we should say for uh, for listeners that haven't caught up with this uh, uh, unprecedented cultural artefact in the broader LMSU universe, um, uh, Tennant was doing some, um, what was it, Saturday night at COP27? I think Tenet? that was, jeez, uh, I think that was actually f- early Saturday morning. Anyway, there was a the, the negotiations were running long. Uh, Tennant hadn't got as much exercise as he had hoped, other than walking around COP twenty seven. Certainly no aerobic exercise. So he broke out the uh, VR headset and the Beat Saber, and I took what I I thought was actually a very artful video of uh, you know z- zooming around the Australia Pavilion, Tennant, and ca- capturing you. Pity about the talent. <laughs> Which, <laughs> Which I then got your permission to uh, post to Twitter, um, which I'm ashamed to say was the uh, the most popular content of my of all of my exploits <laughs> for the entirety of COP27. <laughs> well, clearly the answer uh, to boosting further circulation of videos and perhaps this podcast is to have more VR content and more of one or all of us looking like prize galoots. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it then. It's going up on the YouTube channel to boost our, um, our viewership. Excellent. Well, my dignity is a cheap price to pay for the ever-expanding popularity and indeed global dominance of this podcast. On this week's show, we consider the Australian Government's first annual climate change statement, which was tabled in Parliament last Thursday with a significant tranche of bonus content, but when we last caught up with you all, uh, we were recording uh, on Friday evening uh, as COP27 was winding up, but it hadn't quite finished. There was still a good 36 hours of, yes, COP27 bonus content uh, before us. Uh, Frankie had to shoot through on Saturday morning, but uh, Tina and I stayed till the bitter end, which, as it transpired, was around 9, 10am on Sunday morning. So, um, Tenet, why don't you bring our summer uppers up to speed? Where did COP27 land? So, if I reach back into the dim recesses of whatever brain function I still had by that point, and it was a long pair of nights, the... Final outcome in substance was pretty much what we were expecting uh, when we recorded our last episode. So uh, mitigation, they stuck pretty much to the level of uh, ambition achieved at Glasgow. Uh, Funding for or finance for mitigation adaptation, they took... Uh, steps towards uh, getting the new quantified global goal agreed next year. They did agree to establish this um, 
this financial mechanism, this fund, as part of a mosaic of initiatives to uh, respond to loss and damage and to some degree address it. And they did agree uh, some fairly inscrutable but basically quite positive rules for uh, implementation of pieces of Article 6 international cooperation on mitigation. The broad brushstrokes were were more or less where we thought they would be um, 24 hours before or whatever uh, absurd time it was when we when we recorded but the nuances and the 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 journey of getting there were were a little different and um i i think everybody involved in the cop went through several waves of feelings with respect to the egyptian presidency i think i think first there was a lot of sour grapes and dissatisfaction and then there were there were feelings of Oh no! Did we misjudge them? Are they going to pull a rabbit out of a hat? Is everything going to going to come good? <laughs> Are they in fact strategic geniuses? And then new waves of sour grapes and disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> when the, everyone worked out that no, they weren't actually strategic geniuses. They were just royally screwing things up. Yeah. Well, like one bit of it in particular was weird, and and ungrace, un, ungraceful in its handling. And mm. this was the bit of the cover text, uh, the cover decision, so the, the decision for, for listeners that uh, sits on top of all the detailed substantive decisions, sets a tone, provides some political messages and, and encouragement. Uh, uh, the, the, this uh, was the site of some big fights about was this going to go beyond Glasgow? Was this going to upgrade the call for a phase down of unabated coal to a call for a phase down of all unabated fossil fuels? And in the end, the answer was no. But it did include some unprecedented language specifically calling out renewables for um, playing a, an, an extremely important part in uh, the global decarbonisation and all countries to be encouraged to to accelerate that, um, but then this language about low emissions energy crept in at the like literally the last minute. That is, some text was circulated to everybody that didn't have that language in it, and then on the floor, the presidency said, "Oh, there's this additional amendment," and. We're, we're going to agree to this with the additional amendment. There being no objections, it is so decided. And I think for a lot of people that was the first they heard of that amendment mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the amendment was adding this language about low emissions energy sources. This was read by many as kind of a, a way of uh, creating some space for gas as a, as a transition fuel um, and that, that additional wording was added kind of as a, as a SOP um, towards the, those folk that were um, uncomfortable with renewables being elevated and, you know, potential other, you know, fuels, energy sources in the transition um, uh, not getting uh, acknowledged in the same way. Yeah, well, so um, Franz Timmermans, the EU climate commissioner, uh, said later that he was told by his advisor when this came up, oh, this this language is about nuclear and CCS. And on that, that basis, he was comfortable with it. Um, a bunch of other parties seem not to have seen it at all or had any idea what was going on there. And it just it just went through as, uh, you know, as, as you say, like part of the price of getting sign-on from a couple of parties at least to the, the main statement. And it's not unusual to have amendments to to get some parties on board. It's just weird and unusual for them to be um, both so last minute and so uh, poorly discussed or or understood before they go in. Like uh, last year at Glasgow, when the the last minute change was made to um, change the the phase out of uh, of coal to the phase out of unabated coal phase down of unabated coal 
um, the the presidency and and uh, some of the parties basically made India stand up and and be the bad guy and read that um, text into the um, into the discussion, which was pretty uncomfortable for them, particularly as they were not by any means the only ones who wanted that dilution of the language, uh, and and this time it was it was uh, all very confusing. And I think unhelpfully then led to all this speculation by mothers in the media about exactly what that meant. Yes. Because you had all those parties taking slightly different interpretations about what that allowed for or didn't allow for. Yes. And fundamentally, like, it, it means what parties take it to mean. Mm. I, I think that um, the, the, the kind of the analysis that I found fairly persuasive is in the various wash-ups that I've... Um, that I've read uh, post COP was just the distinction in process and and you know careful building of consensus that took place around Glasgow um, and resulted in a significant step forward in terms of ambition and in consensus relative to what in retrospect seems a very last minute slapdash process that was run by the Egyptian presidency um, having those two cops back to back. Um, is quite stark and not a particularly uh, flattering compare um, for uh, our friends in Egypt, unfortunately. I think the physical construction of that COP served as a strong metaphor for the diplomatic construction of it. (laughs) uh, Things were not finished when it started. Uh, Lots of things that should have been there were not ready. Uh, the, the the cracks were showing uh, along the way and there was uh, uh, a bunch of rubbish concealed behind a thin facade at times. That said, I think the final outcome was actually, in the circumstances, pretty good. And if you if you just think about what has been going on since Glasgow, geopolitically, economically, uh, concern about energy prices, um, it is amazing that we have not, in fact, gone backwards. Um, if anything, we, we are accelerating and um, we're not accelerating as much as is needed to um, bring 1.5 degrees closer within reach, but it could have been a lot worse. I think it's fair to say that if we zoom out of this period of time and have a look back in a few years you'll always think about this cop in the context of the global energy crisis that was going on at the time and that it managed to achieve a a fairly significant commitment around the establishment of a loss and damage fund even though you know funds not pledged to it or anything that's still that's still a significant step forward in a really challenging environment and I think perhaps the rest of it will, with a bit of time, will sort of be background noise. All right. Uh, shall we uh, talk about a climate statement? We should. In September, the Australian Parliament passed the Climate Change Act 2022, which requires the government to table an annual climate change statement in federal parliament. This statement needs to address a range of issues, including Australia's progress towards its emission reduction targets and the effectiveness of climate policy, and importantly, is informed by public advice prepared by the Independent Climate Change Authority. Last Thursday, Climate and Energy Minister Chris Bowen tabled the first annual climate change statement in Federal Parliament. Uh, Frankie, what did it cover? It covered everything, didn't it? I mean, if you hadn't been paying attention to the machinations of climate policy on the daily, like your uh, intrepid Uh, hosts do, this is sort of a pretty good place, um, dare I say, to sum up everything that's been going on. Are they out summering up the summer upperers? I'm glad you said that because uh, uh, it occurred to me as I was reading it that was, this was a bit, little bit like the the opening sort of uh, montage of a Days of Our Lives episode, like previously in Australian climate policy. <laughs> it's a pretty heavily bowdlerized summary, though. <laughs> There's a few downs and a few ups, not not included. 
uh, not not emphasized in the summary. It's it's just the facts, man. I'm trying to think how I now go on to describe this like an episode <laughs> of the Days of Our Lives. <laughs> I mean, like any good soap, it does start by spending half the episode tracking back over what's happened in the last episode before charting a path forward. There's quite a bit of preview of future episodes in this report too. absolutely is. So, okay, well, if I step through it, and Luke, you you gave the brushstrokes of... um, what it is and what it sort of required to be, but but maybe just to perhaps emphasise why this is being delivered. Uh, the, you know, this is uh, this is part uh, of a requirement embedded in the Climate Change Act that was passed by government earlier this year, and they're required to table these uh, every year. So this is the first one of these statements. They have to table it uh, to Parliament. So it's it's a key sort of accountability and transparency measure, uh, and it needs to cover a whole range of things Luke you sort of stepped that out and it also needs to give regard to the the climate change authority as well so then it covers a huge amount of terrain it's it starts by sort of outlining the latest on basically what the science is saying about climate change in Australia so what are the what are the physical effects of climate change currently impacts on environment and biodiversity and importantly, it then takes you know a much broader view, I think, as well than we're perhaps we're used to hearing in this country. And it touches on things like public health and community safety, economic opportunities, national security, even as well. So it's really kind of laying out um, the quite broad impacts of climate change in Australia currently as they are. And actually, one of the more compelling sections um, I read, which I hadn't read the detailed report behind, was the the last State of the Climate report produced by uh, Bureau of Meteorology. And I think with CSIRO is the other agency that puts it together. Um, So they just include a summary of that. And... um, and you know it sort of gives you some like some key facts about what the what the science um is presenting in an australian context and there are some you know there are some shockers in there and when i think we find ourselves sort of confronting this very often the fact that global temperature averages are up over one degree now um the fact that australia's climate has warmed by an average of close to 1.5 degrees 1.47 i think it puts in um it also says that you know that whole huge massive period of disruption that we had through covid is going to have a negligible impact um on slowing down climate so it it goes through a few things like that that's all in the in the framing up of um i guess it's giving us context um for the then the global kind of momentum around mitigation and also the the domestic piece so uh, it spends some time going through uh what the global context is so it touches on the global energy crisis that's happening at the moment it also touches on I think some things that we uh, we have spent time talking about on this podcast in terms of things that I think would give us cause for optimism uh, in terms of the, the the task the the Inflation Reduction Act passed in the US uh, the Euro- uh, Europeans response to Russia's invasion of the Ukraine in um, the Repower EU plan and then the bulk of the the report really starts stepping through like what are the policy pathways towards net zero that Australia needs to start looking at so it steps through uh, quite a lot of things it gives a bit of a summary of where we're at and and kind of what needs to be done perhaps my critique of that is uh, the, I think the structure can use some refining um, into into the next versions of this, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that. And I think probably lastly, the where it sort of uh, ends is it it gives an assessment of our progress against the targets that this government has. Um, so against its uh, 2030 targets, and then looks uh, a bit beyond, and it notes uh, how it's going to be responding to the Climate Change Authority's advice, which was 
was also published alongside this statement, uh, along with uh, a few other documents as well, which we're going to, I think, dig into. I think, uh, Tenant, you got the uh, out of the the climate grab bag, um, you know, projections on um, yeah, the, the emissions forecasts are my secret Santa. Because I was in crisis mode elsewhere I drew this short straw and I'm going to be talking about the the greenhouse gas uh, quarterly inventory update which I'm actually quite thrilled about I nerd out over that stuff and Luke you were um, having a look at the climate change authority advice I did indeed so there's a lot in all of this. Mm. Um, so it was a big package of, uh, of things uh, released and, and Minister Bowen spoke to this statement on the floor of Parliament uh, during the week. But I guess the things that I kind of seized on were where I thought, um, given it does sort of step out where the pathways are that we need to go through and what we're doing so far, to me it kind of showed up where the deficiencies are in the in the policy kind of landscape that we've got at the moment and perhaps where more focus needs to go where where do you, where would you like to start our tour of this um rather expansive statement there is a lot in it and it's mm. it's often more collated restatement than new material new positions there are some things in there that were like in terms of positions that seemed new to me um, and and we can maybe single those out too. Um, but like broadly, like you were saying, this is doing a good job of summarising where we're at. Uh, and I think as future iterations uh, of this report are made, uh, there will be you know more sophistication to some of the elements that are really just placeholders at the moment. Uh, the I mean we'll get to them, but um, the, the the rural and regional impact part is just totally a placeholder, really. But uh, there there is some new stuff in there, and as you say, uh, Frankie, there are some some ostentatiously missing pieces, uh, and I, I reckon we should we should get into both of them. But Luke, what did you reckon? Unsurprisingly, perhaps came to a similar conclusion to you. Like if there's climate and energy nerds out there, going, do I need to read this thing? If it is useful for your job uh, to be across all the things uh, that are going on in the climate and energy space, this is a pretty good way of getting across, you know, stuff that is either agreed and happening, stuff that's under construction or stuff that the government is contemplating. And if you don't need to know that stuff, it's probably, it's, you're probably going to struggle to get through it because um, it is, it is a, a bit of a tough read because it is, it is stepping through in a, in a fairly um, plotting way all of these different areas that um, the legislation requires the government to address. Um, maybe just in terms of framing it up, there are some pretty good graphics in there that if you were if you were skimming through I think are instructive mm -hmm. one uh, on page 11 which really caught my eye was the I guess the characterization of all the stuff that's happened in the last six months um, from which begins in May with new ministry established you know increasing the NDCs reviews of carbon credits Sydney Energy Forum there's an EPBC Act review climate change bills introduced, the electric car discount bill introduced, that sort of got us to August from May, and it just goes on and on and on and on. Um, the government has not been sitting on its laurels, and some of the things on that list committed to before the election, unsurprising that the government is seeking to prosecute them post-election, but there's a number that have emerged uh, in this last six months, um, one of them that we're all particularly interested in, National Energy Performance Strategy Consultation, is on that list. Uh, the Global Methane Pledge that happened just last month is on that list. There's things that are, that, that, while I think we, you know, it sounds like we're going to talk a little bit about where some of the gaps are, um, there are fewer gaps now than there were perhaps six months ago. Yep. Because that space is beginning to be filled out, mm. um, which I think, be something to celebrate. And the graphic on page 11, uh, like it's this curly timeline uh, that, that fills up the page nicely. Now, if if you're doing um, one of these like a year ago or three years ago or five years ago, you know, it would, it would mm. look more like a, a snakes and ladders board. 
where uh, every <laughs> once in a while it seems like you've rolled the dice right and you're going ahead six spaces and then, whoa, unfortunately, <laughs> what you thought you were doing just got ruled out and back you go to the beginning. Um, mm. It has so far, we're very early in the life of a new government. Governments accumulate baggage over time. They uh, have, have, you know... M- often more problems over time. This is all the very early phase of things. But that so far, we, we are proceeding in a pretty rational uh, implement announce policies, develop new policies where there's gaps, recognise the breadth of what needs to be done and, and initiate processes to do it. Uh, so, mm. like, so far, so good. I mean, I th- if you look at just this page, I'm sure one of the intentions of doing it was to convey just how much um, the new government's been up to and I think point taken um, there's lots of things here maybe the and and it sort of goes to your point Luke around you know a lot of this is following up on election promises but there are like quite a few things that aren't and if you pick like just a couple of them uh, maybe a few months before the election uh, you would have thought, oh, we're not, like, we're not going to get there that quickly to talk about, like, maybe the global methane pledge. Mm. You know, even though it's even though it's a voluntary, aspirational thing, um, it implies that more action will come off the back of that. And I think, you know, a year ago, you, you, I don't think you could have um, imagined that. I think the conversation has progressed quite quickly since then from a oh gosh we've got so much to to catch up on after you know quite a few years of not much progress on a few things to you know wow we are just cracking on with it um so in in that sense i think uh, there's reason to feel optimistic about looking at this page there's nothing on that page that i would call total filler demonstrate wave your arms to demonstrate activity filler like these these are all yeah Mm. Things that uh, that needed to be done, and they're being done. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a bit and say what is really apparent when you look at this document, especially as it steps out where the government's commitments are, and even where most of the discussion and content, you know, sort of lies. They're doing an awful lot and spending an awful lot of money on the energy sector tra- transition. Yes. Like that's sort of, you know, top line message for me, number one, disproportionately much more resourcing effort, time, policy being directed at that. And that's great. Needs to happen. But then, you know, the the, the, um, intentions of having um, a statement like this as a transparency and accountability um, measure introduced to parliament does expose where the, where the gaps are and where there isn't much to say. So, you know, there are a few paragraphs on climate adaptation. Uh, and if mitigation and adaptation are two sides of a coin and adaptation is a few paragraphs of an 80-page document, like that tells us we have a lot of work to do uh, on adaptation. So you can, you know, there are some kind of top-line messages you can take away from this document purely focused on where the dollars are because this also makes that very obvious as well um, through the discussion and where a lot of the policy focus has been to date. All that said, it's the first one of these They've been in government for six months and there's lots more work to do. Uh, but it, it's, you know, the starting off point tells you where they need to go next, I think. One of the reasons it was um, it was useful having a flick through the Climate Change Authority's advice um, because they effectively make that point, Frankie. Um, they make the point that um, while uh, electricity is still the highest emitter by 2030 you know on this trajectory it won't be any longer stationary energy and transport um, will uh, uh, be top of the table um, and we don't have very much policy in that space to drive down emissions the other great thing about the the cca statement is something that um that we've certainly discussed in the past is the the importance of sectoral pathways sort of actually starting to break down you know the the relative task 
um, of the different sectors of the economy um, for uh, reducing emissions, who is doing what mm. um, in different sectors is actually a really important question and one that can guide policymakers' application of time, attention and, mm. and budget. Um, these are really useful things for an independent authority to be feeding into the process. Mm. Um, and there, I think there is a strong interest um, from the government in this statement to be actually taking the advice. I think they're substantively interested in what the Climate Change Authority has to say, but I think they also want to be seen to be taking the advice of the independent umpire on this. Mm. And so while, you know, one could frame this statement as, well, this is like the government, the, the government sort of saying all the wonderful things it's doing, it is being pushed a little bit by the structure that it itself has created by, you know, having these folk on the sidelines who have the ability to um, call it as yep. they see it and kind of push some push some thinking in some directions that, you know, with the inertia of government might not other otherwise take place. Yes. So I'm fascinated to see what a, a second year of this statement might look like in in a manner that's a bit more structured that looks at things at a sectoral level that perhaps incorporates more substantially elements of the other papers that are published alongside it, Mm. like the inventory. So you, for example, Luke, talked about the, like the fact that once we deal with the the electricity sector and you know there's sort of plans underway and lots of money being thrown at that, then you you know stationary energy stuff like you know all your scope one emissions from just burning stuff for other things uh, are going to be number one, and those emissions have been increasing, mm. uh, and, and so there's there's a un- there are uncomfortable things to be grappled yes. with. Um, when we start to look at things in a really structured way, uh, because all of a sudden the role of our enormous and, and growing LNG export business uh, in Australia get you know is this sort of right up there top of the pops, mm. um, and and you know these things need to be grappled with. So one of the things that uh, that is in the policy pathways piece of this and uh, was was new to me, at least, to be discussed in this level of detail, was the acceptance of the CCA recommendation that the government develop uh, a, a detailed plan to uh, achieve net zero by 2050. Yep. Now, in theory, yep. Australia has, has one. There was, there was a, a, a plan uh, that was released... Uh, late last year. I think the emphasis in that sentence is in theory. <laughs> well, um, the CCA seems to be treating it as if it doesn't exist and maybe that's just for the best. But what they are saying... <laughs> it's, no, it's no longer in canon. <laughs> we're retconning away <laughs> that one. The, the plan has been recast, but the, the film has yet to be filmed. Um, so <laughs> this 2050 plan, the government said, yep, we'll accept that recommendation. The plan's going to include the 2035 target, which we need to develop uh, for the the UN, uh, the Paris process, by 2025. And it's going to have a bunch of things in it. National carbon market strategy, which will deal with things like the role of international offsets, if any, to 2050. Uh, The technology and innovation strategy, something to do with heavy transport, something to do with industries not covered by the safeguard mechanism, more to say about adaptation. Um, They don't say when they're going to get it done exactly. Like clearly by the end of 2025 would make sense given that the target in it is needed um, in 2025. Um, they, uh, They say... Um, we need to make sure we take the time to get it right. So what I would say about that, and maybe I'm being too kind, I'm not sure. You guys can tell me if I'm being too generous with this. This sounds like an idea that arose from the Climate Change Authority that the government then then needed to make a call on whether they were going to accept that advice. They've accepted the advice. But this is quite a big job, right? Yes. Huge job. Especially done right. To do it properly, 
to actually go through all of those different segments of the economy and actually chart that trajectory and how you're going to achieve that. That is big. And so, you know, we're, 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 we're dealing, and this is the context for all these documents, we're dealing with very short timelines. Yes. The requirement to prepare these reports was only legislated in September. <laughs> And here we are with the first statement uh, from the government. We've got the advice from the Climate Change Authority tabled in Parliament last week. Um, so there's a little bit of like building the track in front of us to yes. all of this. So I am not um, too critical that they haven't set an end point for that task, given how big it is and yeah. given that I, I think it's arisen in the conversation over the last number of months and that they don't necessarily have a fulsome plan for how that's going to be achieved. So to, to, to avoid unjustified carping, because this is, this is a significant commitment, you're right, mm. um, it needs to be done, it's good that they're, they're committing to it. Um, what do we think constructively should be like a part of the process or a part of the, the, the scope to make this plan to 2050 the, the most useful thing it can be. Like I would say something they haven't mentioned, um, but it's, it's totally possible for it to be in scope and it should, is some specific thinking about negative emissions, um, the, the technologies the extent of need for negative and net negative emissions beyond net zero and uh, pathways for um, scaling up what may be needed. Like the, that stuff, it's very controversial. Um, lots of people have got qualms galore. There's big costs, um, but it's pretty important to grapple with and, and there hasn't been a lot of grappling with the real scale of what by being nationally and globally slow on mitigation what we are signing ourselves up for in terms of net negative down the track i'd agree with that i mean i guess what we're talking about here is like the one plan to rule them all and in the darkness bind them in the light come on well, it would be in full <laughs> transparency reported in parliament and in the Hansard bind them. <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so there are, there are obvious things from a governance perspective you'd want to see in that. You'd want to see interim targets or, or signposted timelines for setting interim targets mm. and, and all that. I agree with Luke around sectoral pathways and, and sort of clearly defining and, and as is always the case with things like this, redefining based on the latest information um, each sector's contribution to targets based on the, the latest you know uh, information available as technology costs come down, blah blah blah. Um, I think you'd also want to see articulated how cross-cutting strategies factor in across sectors so you know the three of us talk a lot about energy efficiency in our day jobs and that's relevant across multiple sectors um perhaps the other one uh that i want to point out in terms of um where this statement is deficient because the work hasn't been done yet um we talked we touched on adaptation and i think that is a huge huge job right big curly difficult questions um wrapped up in that and not easy answers for any of it especially when you consider the state of the climate report that basically says you know the australia's hottest year on record was 2019 and at around 1.5 degrees warming that'll be an average year so more of more lots more of 2019s into the future uh if that's the if that's the close to the best case scenario we can plan for that means we need to do things very differently um across a whole bunch of sectors just to deal with the the warming that's baked in the one that i wanted to point out was around the just transition of course that there needs to be a whole focus on that in and of itself for me it was you know it's really underdone in this because there isn't like a standalone um strategy or focus on this at the moment there is lots of nice placeholder text where they talk about how climate change impacts vulnerable 
and marginalized communities and it steps out some of those um, but that's mm-hmm. that sort of not even close to the start of uh, what needs to be done in terms of having a substantial look uh, you know about how how we plan to bring those most exposed um, to the impact of climate change along and have them not just survive but thrive so interestingly and this is again going back to the CCA advice mm. they set out I guess a framework, a draft framework for assessing progress, which um, hits uh, four sort of broad areas that they want to dig into. Um, The first one on the list is not emissions. The first one they describe as well-being. Mm. And so these are the kind of the social elements of the transition, um, including economic impacts and opportunities, uh, physical impacts and adaptation, First Nations and regional and rural Australia. And then it sort of steps through emissions and then kind of policies and, and then kind of the broader context about what's going on in climate science and international ambition and so forth. But I thought it was it was really interesting that they put at the top of the list that, I guess, human-centred uh, mm. lens... Um, for the transition. I think very healthy and, and perhaps, you know, while it's not explicitly using the word just transition, Frankie, it's a recognition from the Climate Change Authority that we can geek out about emissions budgets and we can think about policy gap analyses and sectoral decarbonisation pathways and all the rest of it. But if we don't think about, you know, the, the, the journey that our, you know, our communities in cities and in towns and regional communities around the country, the journey that they're going to go on, um, to this uh, net zero economy, um, then it's very unlikely we're going to get there. And I didn't read this because we, we divided and conquered on the <laughs> the outputs and everything. I think that sounds like a very obviously intentional and thoughtful thing of them to do um, because I think unless you bring these issues right to the forefront of the, the conversation, you, you are at risk of making that you know oh and it's really complicated for all these reasons yeah. because of the way it impacts all these people and then it becomes a bit of a footnote sometimes in the conversation and that's so sort of not the way we need to be need to be doing this um if we're serious about making sure that um you know vulnerable and marginalized communities are, are at the very front of our thinking and i'll just say while we're mentioning that is that the the cca is actually going to be consulting this framework as a draft framework for that they're positing could be a way that they assess progress. They're going to be going and seeking feedback on that framework so that for those of us that are sort of advocates or have a professional interest in this space, there's going to be an opportunity to take mm-hmm. a look at that and um, and provide some input to the CCA, um, which will then kind of be the, uh, the lens through which they look at our progress over time, which is so, uh, an important thing to get right. There's also uh, the Net Zero Economy Task Force that's been formed in the Department mm. of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And that's that's just sort of flagged here as, as a thing that is happening. Um, my understanding is that that has a pretty strong just transition focus uh, to its work, whatever, whatever words wind up getting used. But th- this is another one of these... Um, Work has started, and, and and that's what can be reported at the moment. I would say that the language in the the uh, inaugural statement itself is is still very delicate around what actually are the um, the likely outcomes that regional communities um, heavily involved in coal and gas uh, production for export face. Uh, like there's some some stepping delicately around uh, the fact that there are there are risks in global markets over time. Whereas mm. probably we should be getting towards just like clearer clearer language that if other countries do what they say they're going to do there will be vastly less demand for a bunch of the stuff that we export today. 
There'll be vastly mm. increased demand for other stuff that we export, a bunch of critical minerals, uh, potentially clean energy intensive exports, but coal and gas exports have got a very dim future in a world that acts on climate change. No matter what people reckon about, you know, the, the relative competitiveness of Australian high quality this or that um, in, a, in a world uh, that's where overall demand is shrinking but somebody can be the, the last man standing, well, probably, probably not. And, and, and probably um, even, even if you are the last supplier in the market, if, if that market is going out the back door, you, you're probably not doing that well even if you are still technically in business. I think straighter talk about that stuff separated from the very politically unrewarding uh, discussion about um, Australia being the one to, to, to cut off those exports before the demand is uh, gone, I think is, is better than circumlocutions about uh, emerging risks in the global economy. I clocked that language that you refer to because it is striking in the way in how delicately it's sort of framed and the combination of looking at industries and regions together mm. like just just the fact that those two things that can be quite discreet on their own were lumped together in this report as a sort of mega topic part i think part of the reason for doing that was to also set out the the more optimistic case around where job creation might you know might might come through um on the clean energy generation side of things like it sort of talks about it refers to like the iea's world outlook around clean energy jobs already exceed those in you know fossil fuels worldwide and you know and and they sort of forecast that new jobs related to those industries are all they're all they're going to outweigh job losses in fossil fuel related industries but what this doesn't do is step out where the jobs are could could be could be created and mm. where they're going to be lost and i think the geography of that is probably something that um as you say uh, there probably needs to be more straight talk about and maybe that net zero plan is the place where some of that can be unpacked yeah um in a, in a good version of that plan you'd be able to get into the um the, into the, the details of you know where opportunities are diminishing but also where they're where they're opening up and how we we build a bridge for communities from one to the other. All right. One of the things that this statement does is bury the lead and put the actual projections and how we're progressing towards our target right at the end, which I could criticise, but that's exactly what we've done in this conversation. <laughs> Are we? But we are we going there like now? Like there's so much more to talk oh, about. I think if we're going to finish this report in anything more <laughs> like a gesture towards our intended time frame, yeah, uh, we should get into the projections and the progress. All right. So like that, they're, they're pretty good. Everything looking fine. That's what I heard. Uh, I heard uh, that forty three percent is ambitious. But achievable. <laughs> the the projections for how we're going to do on emissions have this year got two scenarios in them. They've got a baseline scenario that includes basically policies that have already been implemented, but um, and that includes some of the more minor election policies. But it's mostly the pre existing policy base plus many but not all of the things announced by states in the past couple of years. Got, it's got everything up to but not including Victoria's 2035 announcements. Uh, and that says basically current implemented policies or, or announced state policies uh, would take us to 32% below 2005 levels by 2030, uh, a long way short of the 43%. Uh, national target and 38% extending forward to 2035. And then they have an additional measures scenario uh, which includes two extra things and just two extra things and they are uh, the federal government's commitment to achieve 82% renewables by 2030. Now they, they don't have a, like a really crunchy 
uh, mechanism to achieve that. But, you know, um, that is that is not a, a, a crazy thing to include in the projections given the likely effects of all the transmission support and other uh, financial support for, for renewables development and the further state commitments that haven't, yeah, particularly the Victorian ones, that haven't been fully incorporated here. But then the bigger thing that additional measures includes is a reflection of what the safeguard mechanism uh, might deliver. And the safeguard mechanism isn't final. As we record, we're expecting some more details of the government safeguard design in the next few days. Um, the projections team is like inside the government, so maybe they know something we don't. Uh, they, they ought to. I hope so. Let's hope. <laughs> there, are, there are so many things we don't yes. know. Yes. <laughs> But also, they're, they're just having a having their best shot because this this is a big deal. Sure. This policy, and those two things together lift the expected achievement from thirty two percent off two thousand five to forty percent off two thousand five uh, by twenty thirty and forty eight percent off by twenty thirty five. And so this, these project. I mean, we can. There's a lot actually to unpack, and and a little bit of you know disappointing reminders that you know, projections are not uh, magic. Um, they're they're pretty crude tools in many ways, but this is close enough, close enough for government work. Close enough to say we're um, on the path to achieving the forty three percent. And uh, if we do those things that were included as additional policies and we include all the things or we, we proceed with all the things that weren't included, and there's an important list there, um, then we're going to do it or, or improve on uh, that target and be, be well placed for a, a strong 2035 commitment. Um, and before I like, start geeking out about some elements of that, what did you guys think about the projections? I thought it was kind of more optimistic than uh, than maybe I expected. But, you know, when you think about some of the like, very significant commitments by state governments also over the last couple of years and, uh, and our national outlook being you know, effectively a, a sum of all of their cumulative efforts as well as what um, the Commonwealth brings to bear, uh, yeah, perhaps it's not surprising that it's looking um, rosier than perhaps expected. I looked at that 40% with additional measures and I thought, oh, that's interesting. It actually wouldn't be that hard with a bit of ambition, given all the stuff that's left out of yes. those projections and, you know, the EV strategy is yep. not in there, energy performance strategy is not in there, powering regions and national reconstruction funds. There's a lot of stuff that is still yep. to land. Decline of fossil exports is not in there in the long term either. Like there's just an assumption that that industry remains very robust. Mm. It starts to make 43% not only doable, but actually, you know, something that could quite easily uh, be surpassed. Meat and beat. Meat and beat. And I, um, I wonder whether there's, a, whether there's a scenario, once you put it all together, that there's a r relatively straightforward pathway for the, um, the government uh, not just, you know, announcing its 2035 target, but um, actually raising the ambition uh, around its 2030 target to something more commensurate with where others in the parliament um, would like it to be. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought that was, yeah. that was interesting um, and uh, I guess one to watch. Which can I use as a mini segue to my little extracurricular activity, which was to do the very boring short straw look at the um, uh, the quarterly uh, National Greenhouse Gas Inventory update. Don't you listen to um, a, a quarterly projections, a quarterly inventory <laughs> team? You're great. Frankie is cruel. <laughs> No, well, you didn't, you know, I was getting there, Tenant. You just stole in my thunder, but whatever. It's fascinating. More people should read the bloody inventory. Um, thank you, inventory team, for doing a great job because there are some actually kind of awesome insights in this that don't get a huge run in kind of policy wonk land or at least in the conversations that that I find myself having um, on the regular and I might I'll just I'm just going to give like a 
the briefest of snapshots because I could crap on for 15 minutes and we don't have that much time. But uh, these uh, uh, inventories come out quarterly, but the, I think the more useful way of looking at the data is the, the year-on-year uh, sort of cumulative total. So uh, this is the June quarter for 2022, uh, but if you're looking at uh, the year-to-date or the you know uh, this year, including the most um, recent uh, updates, you know, emissions f- for the year to June 2022 have increased by 0.1 of a percent um, on the previous year. And that sort of number is sitting on top of fluctuations across a range of sectors. So you've seen uh, emissions from the electricity sector going down. So that continues to go down with uh, with more renewables, like that went down to so 3.7% transport um, emissions also decreased uh, 1%, but that um, they uh, sort of attribute to COVID lockdowns um, and they're just the reduced use of road transport in general uh, over the 2022 financial year. But then you saw increased emissions from stationary energy. So as we referred to previously, all the stuff that you burn um, for energy outside of electricity. And uh, and that's driven, and that was up 3.1%, um, driven primarily uh, through activity in the oil and gas sector. I had increases in fugitive emissions up 3.4%, reflecting increased production of LNG. And, uh, and there was also some increase uh, in emissions from agriculture, which was up three and a bit percent. That was more around the recovery from drought, um, having increases in livestock. I, I think, can we start a new podcast, which is just you reading the Nationals yes. Greenhouse Inventory Quarterly Update? Are you enjoying it? <laughs> I reckon we have a subset of our listeners that are going to be here for that. That might be a way of monetizing the podcast. Are you enjoying it? Because, I mean, come on. Like, is the excitement not coming through? Are you just, like, relegating me to some, like, after dark radio show? You're like the BBC broadcaster. Oh, I think there's that, an audience for that. What's that classic thing where, like, it's just, it's a thing where people wake up in the middle of the night and people are reading like... It's a like, Black Books episode. No, no, it's a real thing. I'm going to I'm gonna research this and come back to you. Put it in the show notes, Frankie. But like the striking long-term trends that we need to touch on here are around stationary energy mm. and fugitives. The, like stationary energy emissions have gone up 24.8% since 2005. And fugitives have gone up 17.5%. And they're pretty closely connected. Well, I mean, it's about the enormous growth of our LNG export industry, basically. Emissions from energy for liquefaction and uh, leakage of methane and uh, venting of uh, basin CO2, reservoir CO2. Because LNG exports have gone up 233%. Since I think t- 2015, that's just the last seven years. Yep. So anyway, there's a big story in that, people. I indulge <laughs> myself, but you know that was worth it. Come on, it is. It is really important. It actually goes goes back to the role that the CCA is going to have in kind of focusing in some of the areas that are harder to abate in the sense that, you know, perhaps we don't have the technology or, you know, there's there's not a clear pathway, but also harder to politically grapple with, mm. right? Um, and, and which, you know, without that uh, spotlight being shone on them, um, governments might find themselves focusing on the, the sexier bits of the energy transition while we, where, in fact, what we need to do is start grappling with the harder questions Mm. and i mean you know this is a this is an export industry so i think a lot of our conversation and obvious policy focus is around the domestic economy and a lot of these emissions are being created for the purpose of exporting resources anyway we all know there's a big conversation in that it's it's one thing to say that it's another thing to see it in the numbers numbers talk numbers talk Tune in next week. 
<laughs> I'm going to start going through the back catalogue. That's the name of the uh, the segment. It's Numbers Talk with Frankie Muskovich. Oh, I love it already. But I feel like I'm st- I feel like I'm encroaching on tenants' natural territory. Numbers though. love us all, Frankie. True. There's there's room in the heart of numbers for many people. Oh, I love it. All right, it's time for one more thing in which we all share something that is currently captivating our attention. Frankie, what have you got? Well, I was just having a look at the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory (laughs) Quarterly Update for March 2022. (laughs) Hang on. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Although, Uh, watch this space. I'll be back next week. Inventory watch. Inventory watch. (laughs) Oh, I love it already. Uh, Okay, so my one more thing uh, was a lovely visit to Parliament House this last week. Uh, Luke, you and I were there for ASBEC's council meeting at the end of the year, Uh, ASBEC being the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council. Um, It's the umbrella body for peaks who care about sustainable buildings. Uh, There's a lot of us. And at our last meeting of the year, we launched a report. It's called Unlocking the Pathway, Why Electrification is the Key to Net Zero Buildings. And uh, I'm very excited about this. It's something that uh, has been uh, beavered away on over the last couple of years, really, um, from go to woe through some of uh, COVID. And the the report finds that electrification of Australia's buildings would save almost $50 billion between 2024 and 2050 uh, over a BAU strategy uh, of, you know, electrification, gas and offsets. Um, and it would save almost 200 megatons of CO2. Uh, before offsets so anyway i'm very excited about that report um it's got some significant findings it's got some policy recommendations as well um and it sort of uh, the summary report sits on top of um some very meaty um technical reports um and modeling uh that were done that looked at so three plausible but divergent scenarios where we looked at 100% electrification of buildings. We looked at a combination of electrification and green hydrogen and a base case that's you know much more of a, a BAU and sort of aligns to the, I forget what the scenario is called in ISP that basically reflects more of a BAU, but that one. And uh, yeah, unsurprisingly, it finds that electrification is the lowest cost option not to say that it's a no cost option um, in every building type I think what it also unearths is that this isn't a no cost exercise in in a lot of um, building types Uh, but given we need to get to to net zero by 2050 uh, and um, you know, no, no action or BAU is uh, is by far the, the most expensive option to take. So, uh, it it calls out um, all sorts of uh, policy levers that need to be looked at, including the National Construction Code. Uh, it talks about having a national plan for the phase out of fossil gas in buildings, appliance standards, um, incentives taking a look at market inequalities and a just transition. There's lots of goodies in there for all your building wonks and electrification advocates out there. Very exciting. It is very exciting, particularly in the context of the recent Victorian election, which uh, saw uh, voters uh, in that great state endorse a 75 to 80% emissions reduction target by 2035. Uh, now, it's already going to be pretty challenging uh, to get to the 2030 target of 45 to 50% without uh, taking a close look at uh, uh, gas use in that state. Um, uh, Victoria's got Buckley's of getting anywhere near 75 to 80% without, you know, really grappling with how to decarbonise fossil gas. And so uh, this input from ASPEC uh, hopefully will uh, be grist for the mill as policymakers in Victoria look to uh, fill out the policy agenda in support of that big, bold 
emissions reduction target? I mean, I should just say that this analysis reflects analyses that are happening all over the world. But I think, you know, important for our purposes in Australia, it is useful and important to contextualise the challenge um, to Australia. And there was a really good discussion paper that um, that sort of informed the modelling work that stepped out kind of where our fossil gas use is in, in buildings and even in the just in homes, 80% of gas use is... Um, is just concentrated in two states, Victoria and New South Wales. So you're right to highlight um, Victoria and the significance of its uh, recent commitments because it, um, you know, it's sort of the, the state that has some of the, the highest use of it uh, in a household and, and commercial building context. Indeed. All right. Tenant, what have you got? So my, my non-climate... One more thing for people who would like to take their minds off very, very heavy topics a bit, uh, but still find their way into some, um, actually some pretty big ideas, is a little movie called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, uh, which is uh, the best of the recent crop of multiverse what-if Uh, There's an infinity of parallel universes movies. Uh, This is is definitely the best of them, and I've liked some of them quite a lot. Uh, It stars Michelle Yeoh, who is uh, amazing as a put-upon laundry proprietor who finds uh, that she is at the centre of the multiverse uh, and that she alone can uh, can save it from a terrible yet oddly familiar threat. Uh, but it, this is just uh, a terrific and creative and profanely hilarious action movie as well as a deeply moving like family drama. Uh, I loved it so much. Uh, I, I've watched it twice in the past fortnight. I can't recommend it highly enough. But I will say that everything, everywhere, all at once is also an apt descriptor of what the freshly re-elected Victorian government is going to need to do (laughs) to meet its extremely bold and ambitious emissions reduction commitment for 2035. (laughs) Are you saying, Tenet, that we may need to pull in alternative Lily D'Ambrosios from the multiverse in order to prosecute the full sweep of policies that could achieve that 2035 I think that being able to call on a multiversal set of skills to be simultaneously (laughs) a a dance fighter, a teppanyaki chef... All sorts of skills are going to be needed to make this thing work because 75 to 80% emissions reductions by 2035 is going to require the stuff that you were referring to, Frankie, around um, transition from uh, natural gas in a, in a whole lot of context, but particularly uh, in homes. But it's also going to require all the sorts of things that we've been talking about in the national scene, but uh, bigger and faster uh, much like Michelle Yeoh's Fists of Fury. So uh, I think uh, there's there's action and touching family drama to come from the state of Victoria. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to the, the graphic novelisation of the Victorian energy transition. I, uh, I just uh, knocked over the latest quarterly essay from uh, sometime guest co-host of the uh, Let Me Sum Up podcast uh, Catherine Murphy it's titled Lone Wolf Albanese and the New Politics and while it is a pretty interesting account of uh, our freshly minted Prime Minister's origin story what makes him tick and particularly his growth as a leader over the last three years um, our audience is likely to be particularly interested in Catherine's account of the internal debates around climate policy, which took place in the Labor Party between the 2019 and 2022 elections. And um, the path that led to a, a new shadow climate and energy minister, but a platform 
that put climate change um, right at the heart of the argument for an Albanese government, which was by no means guaranteed. There were many twists and turns in uh, in the journey to that 43% target and um, putting things like the, the safeguard and that 82% renewables target right in the forefront of uh, the government's election campaign. So to the degree that there's a lot of stuff happening uh, under this new government, um, that's been enabled by a pretty clear mandate um, to get on with the job. Uh, and um, it's interesting to... Uh, the blow by blow of how exactly they got there. So, um, uh, Catherine Murphy turns out she can write a bit. It's a cracking read, uh, and um, I highly recommend it. I'm glad to see that uh, the book wasn't held back too much by her taking some time off to yak with us. Oh, indeed. Well, um, you know what we haven't done? We haven't pointed to the, the survey. survey. The survey. The survey. For our special upcoming holiday episode of the Let Me Sum Up podcast, where we will do what? Instead of reading a climate report and talking about it, we will watch a climate movie and talk about it. But, um, geez, there was a bit of controversy on Twitter about uh, the the three climate movies that we proposed <laughs> that we would watch. Did people actually uh, vote for the three that were there or just suggest a whole bunch of new ones that we should have done instead? Yes. <laughs> yes, both. There, there are a bunch of votes for the ones that we put up on the poll and then there's a very uh, a fulsome discussion about the deficiencies of that list um, up to and including a uh, strident argument that, in fact, Naked Gun 2.5 is a climate <laughs> movie <laughs> and should, should be number one with a bullet. <laughs> oh, God. Who's trying to make me watch Naked Gun 2 and a half? <laughs> Bea Jafari made a strong case for the inclusion of Dune on the list. But oh, I love Dune. Ultimately, that could not be accepted because the same argument would have put Avatar on the list and that cannot be allowed. Not because it's a bad movie, but because it is not a climate movie. One of the things that emerged over the course of this Twitter conversation is the governance around this whole uh, vote is very lax. <laughs> I guess the question is that we need to resolve here and now is uh, like we're not restarting the survey to incorporate all no. those movies. Why are not? We? Why not? No. Why wouldn't we just add more options as we go? It'd be well, you hilarious. Can't add more options. We would have to stop the survey and start it again. Oh, you're making like, it no sound way. like it's a really big deal to press a button once and go add this more <laughs> whirly gig. Once this juggernaut is underway, it stops the moment. <laughs> The let me sum up electoral machine is beyond you, it's beyond me, it's beyond anyone. I violently disagree with this. This is our fortnightly one hour, 45 minute podcast that finds all sorts of ways of getting more complicated from simple Uh, premises. This is very uh, on brand for us. You want to shut down the survey and start it again? No, I just just want to refresh it. Like, can't can't you just... (laughs) No, I think we're going to have to kick this one to the Climate Change Movie Authority, (laughs) but only once there's legislation to direct them. So you have to start again because it's unfair on the people that have already voted because they have voted on the basis that these are the That's three right. options. Nah, they, they missed the opportunity to put a protest vote in up front Thank like you. they've had their say. Stop the steal. <laughs> no. <laughs> Can't make up the rules after the election started. It doesn't stop other Look, people. I- <laughs> We, I'm, I'm open to this idea, but we would need to just reboot the whole thing with a much longer and arguably sillier list of movies, uh, because there were some, there were some doozies okay. proposed by our summer uppers. Well, I don't want to watch Naked Gun two and a half, so maybe we <laughs> draw the line for this year, but then for next year, we get, we have like a period of nominations. Mm. There you go. Governance there you go. sorted. Okay. All right. I think that's a good a, a good settlement that we've arrived at. Mm. <laughs> Please don't suggest Naked Gun 2.5 next year. <laughs> well, we've just guaranteed that they're going to now. I know. That's all right. All right. Well, that is our show for today. We're all on Twitter. Frankie is at... Frankie Muscovich. Tenant is at... Tenant Reed. And I'm at Luke... Menzel, uh, if you've got a, uh, a report uh, that we should read or indeed a movie that we should, we should watch at some point in the distant future, you can email us at mailbag at 
www.thepodcast.net. Um, of course, you should be subscribed to us in your favourite podcast app, and you can find the full back catalogue of episodes at letmesumup.net. But for Frankie Muskwich and Ken Reid, I'm Luke Menzel. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon. Forgot to promote the YouTube. <laughs> 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 we stop having time to talk about the reports because of all the various side hustles. Yeah, can, we, can we just cut down this whole report business? Like, yeah. Yeah, come on. People, people read enough reports. What they don't get enough is being told uh, various ways in which they can consume more of our increasingly light on content content. That's right. They came for the reports, but they stayed for Tenant's Beat Saber videos. Videos? There's going to be a series now. <laughs> I've just ensured there will be one, Tenant. I'm just well. going to stalk you around and film you doing things when you've got VR goggles on. What we've got to do is do the augmented reality mixed media video so that people can see after a moment what I look like in VR, which is extremely cool, mm. as opposed to what I look like in meat space, which is a sad dickhead. I think that's unfair. I don't think you look like a sad dickhead. Well, no, I, I, I did you... look like an extreme weirdo. You, look, you looked unusual, but <laughs> <laughs> that's just because people aren't used to used to seeing people doing um, that physical activity in VR. Um, I was I was very impressed. You were very well coordinated. Your whole affect was one of someone that was being very competent at something which was confusing and impenetrable. That's that's my shtick. <laughs> <laughs>